You're listening to Passions and Prologues, a literary podcast where each week I interview an author about a thing they love and how it inspires their work. I'm your host, Adam Sokol, and today's guest is Jay Ryan Straddle. We have an absolutely delightful conversation about what is obviously a very large topic, but we dive into it in a very specific manner. Uh, Jay is the author of the new book, Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club, an absolutely delightful story about several generations of a family who own a diner or a supper club, as it is known in the Midwest. And we get into, you know, what that means having a restaurant kind of thrust upon you, whether you want to have it or not, and the implications of what it means to be a community center and a place that people have come to rely on. It's a really great conversation. Uh, Jay's other novels include Kitchens of the Great Midwest and The Lager Queen of Minnesota. The discussion topic we focus on at the beginning of this podcast is food. We dive into it in a very specific manner because as you may have guessed from the names of these stories that he has written, Jay is a Midwesterner just like I am. We talk about our respective histories with food, what it was like growing up in Midwestern families. We talk about some very specific Midwestern style food and diners and different things. This was like having a conversation with an old friend, uh, even though we had never met before this discussion. In fact, when we got done recording, we came to realize that he often visits my neighborhood uh, from time to time. And we are thinking about going to get dinner at a very specific place when he does come here. So a lot of fun. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Before we dive into that conversation, I want to give you guys a book recommendation. Uh, This past weekend, I adored Love and Saffron, which has been out since last year. It's by Kim Fay, and it's described as a novel of friendship, food, and love. It's an epistolary story, which is told in the way that two different Women write letters back and forth, and they form a friendship with each other. Uh, Basically, what happens is one of them reaches out to a writer of a specific uh, recurring article in a newspaper that she has come to love, and she basically writes a fan letter, and they talk about the specific food that the writer is getting into. They exchange recipes back and forth, and they form a really delightful friendship. It's extremely quick. It's so heartfelt. It is probably going to make you cry, but it is a book that just made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. And who doesn't love a cozy little story? So that's Love and Saffron by Kim Fay. I also want to thank everyone who has reached out to me via email at passionsandprologues at gmail.com. I love hearing the things you guys are all passionate about, and it really, really means the world to me to see those things. And I give away a random bookshop.org uh, gift card to one listener every single month who sends me the things they're passionate about. I also want to thank the people who have left reviews recently on the podcast page, wherever you listen to your podcast, whether it's Spotify or Apple Uh, Seeing those really does make my day and it helps people find the podcast just a little bit more easily. Uh, And also one last thank you to everyone who has connected with me on Instagram and TikTok at Passions and Prologues. It's just really lovely hearing from other readers and getting to chat a little bit. Okay, those are all my thank yous. I really, really appreciate you all. I am so delightfully excited for you to hear this conversation with Jay Ryan Shradal author of Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club on Passions and Prologues. Okay, Jay, what is something you are super passionate about that we're going to be discussing today? Food. Food. Excellent. Okay. So, <laughs> so for people who may not know, Jay and I are both Midwesterners. We were just talking about this before we uh, before we started recording. So I'm really hoping that's the route we're going to go to. But um, can you sort of like dive into it? What is, uh, you know, what is your particular, you know, thing about food that you love? Is it the cooking it? Is it the exploring new stuff? Sort of like dive in. Let me know what it is all about food that fascinates you. I grew up in a small town in southeastern Minnesota, or a series of them, really. All generally far enough away from the city 
the big city to make that panoply of uh, options easy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, growing up working class, we didn't eat out a lot. And when we did, it was places that were accessible to our price range. My parents also had undemanding palates. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not going to say uninteresting, but I didn't get exposed to a wide range of food, mm-hmm. but I'd read about it. I knew different cuisines existed because I'd read about them in books and magazines. And as soon as I could, I got a driver's license, which wasn't as, unfortunately, it wasn't as soon as I could have got a driver's license. I got on my third try. I was almost 17 when I finally acquired it. But by that point, I had been working for a few years. I had disposable income, as teenagers sometimes do. And uh, I chose to spend it on music and food. Uh, I had a, a list of restaurants I wanted to go to mm-hmm. that I couldn't wait to try as soon as I could get to them. My parents weren't going to bring me to them. They weren't against it. They just weren't enthusiastic about it. They're like, why would you go there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was baffling to them. It was like me saying, you know, hey, I, you know, I'm going to join a ska band. You know, mm-hmm. they'd be equally puzzled. Yeah. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps they would have preferred me being in a ska band. I would have been closer to home more mm-hmm. often. Uh, uh, the garage might have been louder. But overall, I couldn't wait to eat at restaurants. I loved eating in restaurants growing up. It was a rare occasion. And I knew there were other kinds of food out there, and I knew I had to take it upon myself to find them. I'm, I'm a more enthusiastic diner than chef. I'm an intermediate chef. I enjoy cooking, but I like eating more. I'm a I'm an end user. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm a consumer, uh, just a devoted consumer of food. And now I get to live in Los Angeles where there's some of the best uh, Mexican and Korean food in the world, among other things. And uh, had friends in town who are also Midwest natives who now live in Seattle. And we sought out Malaysian food when we were here. We drove out to Alhambra. And it's just fun doing the, doing that kind of stuff. That's what I think about still when I think about how to schedule a weekend is, okay, where are we going to eat? And how do we build the rest of the weekend around that? Mm -hmm. It's a little more complex now being a father of a three-year-old who has food opinions. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. But luckily we have a nice list of babysitters and uh, we go somewhere uh, (laughs) that will be hostile or uh, uninteresting to a three-year-old. We don't have to bring them along. It's just, it still continues to be more than a preoccupation, just a a focus. Mm -hmm. And certainly in my writing too, when I sat down to write. I just wanted to write stories in which food was very central. And uh, I would build themes around food and use food as a setting to 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 tell larger stories about themes like legacy in my current book mm-hmm. and family and uh, other things I'm passionate about and interested in solving and resolving. But food to me has always been one of these things that, well, where I'm from, It's one of the few topics that everyone can agree on. (laughs) People got to eat. They don't always agree on what to eat. Yeah. Or what what they want on their pizza. But people like pizza. Mm -hmm. We can can start there. And I find writing about it just makes me happy. I get up from the computer after a day of writing about a restaurant or a chef. And I go, that was great. Mm -hmm. Even if this day of writing doesn't end up in the book, I'm happier for having done this. I love this so much. First off, I I was laughing at with, when you first started talking about your your parents like the places that you guys might go as a family. Mm. My uh, again, this for everyone listening, this is gonna be a somewhat midwestern conversation. I just I so rarely get like a like minded person who's also from like this area. We used to go to uh, Bob Evans. Oh yeah, frequently. yeah. Bob uh, Evans for me was uh, if you don't mind me interjecting, this, please. The first place where I ever had a meal. That came out directly from under a heat lamp. Mm-hmm. That wasn't a fast food restaurant. Yeah, yeah. That, and I was impressed by this. Mm-hmm. I was delighted. I yeah. sat down, ordered something, and I got it like in two minutes. Mm-hmm. Like at a sit down restaurant. I was like, this place is the future. <laughs> this place is the only place we should be going. Yeah. We got our food so fast and it met my expectations. Yeah. But also at the same point of my life, the pinnacle of fine dining was Red Lobster. Oh, yeah. We had like a swear jar slash. Mm-hmm. slash chore jar that we'd get to bank money in. And once it was filled, 
Like we could go to Red Lobster, untouchable. So, so ours, my my dad, um, my dad was a he owned an insurance agency for the entire oh, of my wow. life. But like before then, he was a manager at a at a Bob Evans. So like to him, and oh, you talk wow. about Pinnacle, yeah. So you talk about Pinnacle, like we would go there. You know, everyone. I'm the youngest of four children, so like all of us would get our various, whether it was like the country fried, you know, steak or the open faced roast beef sandwich or cow, oh, yeah. whatever everyone's getting. They're all winners. Yes. The whole time he's just basically commenting on like, well, you know, my day we would go around and we'd be, I, this water will be full. Like I still to this day remember him like having these comments, but our pinnacle, <laughs> you're talking about like going out, like when we had a birthday meal, it was like Olive Garden it was like our oh. kind of, yeah, that was our like, uh, you know, it, it didn't have the same, you know, bread lobster, it didn't have the cheddar bay biscuits, but it did have the breadsticks still. So it was very similar, but I'm similar to you in the sense that like once I, you know, got out of the house, went to college and I, uh, you know, then graduate school and living on my own, like same thing in the sense, like I started discovering all these new foods that I like. And like, it's not that my parents aren't like quote unquote adventurous. They'll, they'll try different things. But like you said, I, I have come to discover my favorite moments are going to a restaurant, especially in a new town, like whether it's um like I went to Ash or I went to South Charleston, South Charleston, Carolina to like do a bunch of oysters or excellent food city. Yeah. Recently I was in San Francisco for work oh, and my, yeah. my boss is legendary. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. And you, you mentioned uh, Malaysian food. We went to like a, a Malaysian restaurant there and that like, I, I've been thinking more and more like you were talking about it, how it connects to storytelling in a sense. Like we sat down as a team at this Malaysian restaurant and she ordered for the whole table. She asked if she could do it first. She's very much uh, like a mom of our team. It's adorable. But like she ordered all this different stuff. And, you know, that, that becomes like an opportunity for everyone to try different food. And I know lots of people have their thoughts on wanting their own meal versus sharing. But the whole time, all it did was it sparked these conversations amongst like one another. And we started basically telling like almost stories of our own experiences. And so I totally hear you when you say like, you know, these ideas of going to a restaurant and spending time like it really does spark an opportunity to tell stories. So like for you, when did you first realize you're like, oh, I really want to, not only do I love this process and this whole idea of going out and trying different food, like when did you realize you also found joy in writing about those experiences? I'll answer that question, but first I need to interject with one comment, knowing where you are in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Have you been to Pacific East in Cleveland Heights? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's actually... Yeah, I love yeah, yeah, that's where I eat Malaysian food in Cleveland. <laughs> oh man, they have got that whole Malaysian menu in the back, like that. They have got this thick menu that's front loaded with all the Japanese cuisine. But keep uh -huh. turning, and you end up with the Malaysian cuisine, and it's excellent. Yeah, when we get done recording, we're gonna have a conversation about that in, in a bit. But yeah, no, I that yeah. their food is phenomenal. Yeah, no notes. Yeah, no notes. Right. Oh yeah, writing about it to me is the second best thing after eating it reliving it and also trying to think of ways to describe it that haven't been done yet or at least new to me mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, trying to describe it through the lens of a character and that character's values and perspective uh, which will always add novelty to a description if you know the character well enough so yeah I love the opportunity to write about food and to create characters that have reasons to mm -hmm. express opinions about it and have experiences related to food that are deeper than just consuming it that, you know, characters for whom food is uh, a load bearing wall for them in some aspect, whether emotionally or financially. Uh, so setting a book in a restaurant, which I hadn't done yet, mm -hmm. was a lot of fun for me. And there was no question for me about what kind of restaurant I would choose. I chose uh, supper clubs, which to me are resolutely Midwestern mm -hmm. and have a lot of unique quirks to them. But the only hard part for me was I wrote most of this book during the pandemic where I couldn't actually go to them. I, not only am, am I marooned in California where there are no supper clubs, uh, even if I like, <laughs> could have traveled during the Midwest for much of the time I was writing this book, it, yeah, it, it, it would have been difficult. Yeah. And I also had just become a father for the first time in December, 2019. So oh, wow. Uh, my uh, partner Brooke was working full time and I was the stay at home dad, uh, caring for an infant Well. uh, writing a novel. Mm -hmm. um, so there were a number of reasons I couldn't just get up and go to Minnesota <laughs> and uh, march into my supper club of choice. But that said, um, 
Luckily, I had a lifetime of memories to lie back on. My own work experience at a separate club in Wisconsin as a teenager and uh, doing phone and email interviews with current and former separate club owners, including my former boss at the Steamboat Inn in Prescott, Mm -hmm. Mike Rowan. So uh, for people to keep my responses brief so that we don't just get sidetracked and talking about Midwestern food the whole time, for people who may not be familiar like how would you describe a supper club so because it is like you said it's so uniquely midwestern like you saying it i can think of like this place like the slovak home and these different places that i i am very much familiar with but for people who may not know how would you describe a supper club so they can start to understand the you know the the area and sort of like the the environment that they'll be diving into when they read your new book to me they're homey family owned family run restaurants that make you feel more like a guest in a home than a customer in a transactional relationship. For starters, most supper clubs, in fact, all should by design and rule, not all do, but many do, give you a plate of free food when you sit down called a relish tray. And this relish tray can encompass any number of items based on the owner's whims and tastes. Mm -hmm. I've had cheese curds on them. I've had pickled herring. I've had pickled watermelon rind. Quite often you'll get an array of raw vegetables, but nonetheless, you're getting free food just like you would if you go to the house of a polite person that knows, that has manners, knows the protocol and says, oh yeah, take a load off here. I'll, what, what would you, would you like anything to drink? Here's a, here's a plate of snacks. You know, it's like that. It's like, welcome, welcome over, take a seat, take a load off. Here's a plate of snacks. Can I get you a drink? And um, one of the many quirks of supper clubs is the old fashions by default are made with brandy Mm -hmm. and you have to ask if you don't want a brandy old fashioned, you have to specify that in your order. Uh, By default, you'll get a brandy old fashioned. So stand warned, having lived in California for almost 25 years and become accustomed to whiskey and rye old fashions, when I ordered an old fashioned at a supper club, having forgotten this Mm -hmm. set of protocols, uh, I was a little shocked that like someone melted a popsicle. Like, wow, what's this sweet concoction? It's not an old fashioned. Mm-hmm. Like, I ordered an old fashioned. What's this? You know, that's an old fashioned. Yeah. You wanted something else? You should ask for something else. And it's my bad. It's my, uh, my, mm-hmm. my fault. I want to develop the taste for brandy old fashions. And if, if it's what you expect, they'll satisfy you. I'll yeah. put it that way. Like, yeah, grasshoppers for dessert. Uh, quite often the server will come around and say, when do you want your grasshoppers? Not do you? They're like, when? How many yeah. grasshoppers? I had one supper club owner say that practice of saying, when would you like your grasshoppers? Mm-hmm. Uh, like, hey, can I bring you out your grasshoppers? Helped put their kid through college, yeah. like a summer of of hard selling grasshoppers to tables. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. For people, so for people just to know, like, it's similar to, it's it's like a very, it's a much more like homey neighborhoodly way of like when you go into Starbucks and you order a cup of coffee and they say, what else can I get you? It's not, can I get you anything else? It's what else can I get? It's that like implication of like, well, of course you're going to get these grasshoppers. It's just, when do you want them to come out? Yeah, that is such a an intelligent way of saying it. So now that yeah. you've gone from, you said Midwest to California and you, when you do get these opportunities to go out, what are the types of restaurants you seek out? Oh, well, quite often I still seek out things I haven't had yet mm-hmm. or things I rarely get exposed to. Yeah, for example, yeah, just last weekend, Jeremy Schmidt, Diana Kowalski, and Brooke and I went to Malaysian cuisine in Alhambra. I hadn't eaten in Alhambra since before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. It's a wonderful neighborhood uh, where a lot of the Asian diaspora have settled uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. And as such, there's a wonderful array of beautifully authentic and unique uh, restaurants out there, mm-hmm. both by and for that community. And it's 20 minutes away from where I live in Burbank. Here, you know, we're, we're missing out on a few things. We don't have supper clubs. There's a few restaurants kind of like them, mm-hmm. but no, there's no supper clubs as such in yeah. this part of town. I, I try to play to an area of strengths wherever I am. I don't go to Prague and look for Mexican food. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but here on Los Angeles, yeah, or the Los Angeles area, yeah, I, I seek out different varieties of Mexican food. I find myself now as the father of a toddler somewhat, yeah, limited in terms of scope, uh, you know, being that there's a third vote and it's usually it's kind of one that demands the most boring food possible. But that said, we, we've endeavored to expose him to new things. And 
unlike me, he'll have he'll have had the opportunity to try the things outside his comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I at least want to give him that the opportunity to try. He doesn't have to love them. Yeah. In in fact, having a having a child has taught me a lot about a lot about hey, you know, you just give them the opportunity to shine. You don't tell them how to do it. <laughs> yeah, just uh, open the door and they'll decide whether they want to waltz through it or crawl through it or dance through it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. But so in terms of food, I'm trying not to impose my values, but mm-hmm. I am trying to create opportunity. I will say, I, I love what you said about like basically not forcing the issue. Like wherever, and I, this is just, this is my PSA to people. Like wherever you're going on a vacation or a trip, like seek out, what the local cuisine is like if you're if you come to cleveland i'm going to take you to a little polish diner and you're going to have pierogi if you're like when i was in san francisco like i said we tried all this different food but we were our daytime jobs there we were working in the castro so the when my boss was like where do you want i was like i want a burrito like i want a san francisco burrito so yeah that is that's my i'm in agreement with you like no matter where you're going but find out like what the local you know like the international flavor is like the, the people and like the the personalities and the, it's the best way to experience a culture and also a community. And so like, you know, along those lines, I'm, I'm hoping you can kind of give my listeners sort of an introduction to Saturday night at the Lakeside Supper Club, because it is a little bit about like community and family and these things that you can discover when you, when you go to restaurants. So can you kind of introduce my listeners to the new book? Yeah, it's the story of a supper club through four generations since they're almost always family owned and operated. It seemed to me the perfect vehicle through which to explore legacy, mm-hmm. uh, being that that was also a new preoccupation of mine, being becoming a dad for the first time. Yeah, it's the story of this restaurant and how every generation doesn't necessarily enthusiastically accept it mm-hmm. as its birthright and how and what they do about it. I, having interviewed a number of supper club owners, I certainly met quite a few whose children, you know, had to work in that restaurant as soon as they could work. And, uh, didn't want to anymore once they had a choice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a story of the story of a restaurant, but also the people who run it, their lives, what they want out of life, how this restaurant relates to changing trends around it through the years. And it's very rare for any kind of business in America to last 100 years, rarer for a restaurant. But there are supper clubs in the Midwest that are approaching 100 years old mm-hmm. and the one in my book is the is one of them is mm-hmm. is the same way and nonetheless still constantly reckoning with its survival as each new realm of trends come to encounter it from generation to generation and each new generation develops its own value system in relation to this place that you know to be to be uh not unfair stubbornly resist change one of the things I actually love about supper clubs is how they're kind of out of time. They're anachronistic and uh, thro- they're throwback restaurants without even trying to be. Quite quite often they haven't either had the wherewithal or the finances to update. <laughs> and now it's come to the point where, you know, we shouldn't because people are coming here for this milieu that that hasn't been updated in 30 years or longer. So I wanted to talk about that in the book too. So it's a book about food, it's a book about legacy, it's a book about family, and it's a book about whether or not it's too late to be a good parent to your child. Like, at what point do you get, do you, you know, in raising your child, do you realize like, you know what, I can correct these mistakes. It's, Mm -hmm. you always can. At least I believe that. I love this so much. Where I I grew up in Lorain, Ohio, which is like 45 minutes west of downtown Cleveland. And in the Lorraine, like the city of Lorraine, there is a bakery called Kajowski's Bakery. They are, mm. they've literally won best bakery in America um, through this like, I don't know if it was Thrillist or one of those random places, but they are a generational bakery that Mr. Kajowski um, founded it. And he has four sons that I grew up with and they all, two of them work there full time, the other one's help. And it's a situation where they become well known for two things. One is the snoogle, which is this long, thin pastry that they made by accident that has been like, <laughs> Bill Mary has been trying to buy for them for like years and they just refuse. And the other oh, I love thing it. is another very Midwestern thing. They make punchki, which for anyone who doesn't know, punchki is basically like a traditional Polish, uh, it's a traditional Polish donut that you fill with. It's basically, it's used for right at the beginning of Lent 
So what they used to do in Poland is like any sweets that were left, they would put into the punchki and on Fat Tuesday, they would eat everything so that there were no more sweets in the house because during Lent, you're not supposed to have sweets. You're Catholic. And they make upwards of like five to six, like 50 to 60,000 punchki every February. And Please. so all four of the sons come back and like all the family are there and they're making them like this old fashioned way. And it's like, but at the same time, I've actually been thinking about this for them as like a family. It's like, okay, but what happens when Mr. Kudrowski and Mrs. Kudrowski retire? And like, yes, two of the sons work there, but like, what comes next? Like this isn't, this place is an institution, but it, and they make things old, the old fashioned way. But like you said, it's, yes, it's like quaint and delightful when you walk in and there's polka music, but at the same time, like you can go to a normal, like quote unquote, normal bakery or like a Dunkin' Donuts that where they're basically just like, you know, processing these donuts and they're cheaper and they come out faster. And it's like, I love that you wrote about this in the book. These like these questions of like, okay, well, is it, like a family quote unquote birthright slash expectation that a son or daughter takes on this suburb club? Is it, you know, the expectation and like birthright that they need to continue doing it the old fashioned way? There's all these questions that like for all of the things that we love about suburb clubs and these local bakeries and all these things, all those reasons we love them are also reasons that it, it does make them very, very hard to keep going, especially today. Yeah, and I think about that a lot in terms of how restaurants fit into the arc of progress. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to look at a lot of things now that 100 years ago were normal that we now consider to be immoral, if not destructive. Mm -hmm. uh, like various medical practices, <laughs> technologies, the way people treated other people. Yeah, progress tends to go in a more humane and thoughtful direction when it's going well. <laughs> and... Sometimes I think about how that will affect food in restaurants. Yeah. Uh, certainly, there is a lot about the way we eat and a lot about the food industry that's destructive to the environment that you can look at and say, hey, in 50 years, these things we're nostalgic for, our grandchildren are going to consider to be uh, immoral, mm -hmm. you know, if not destructively retrograde. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Like a hamburger might be looked upon in 80 years the way we look at cigarettes now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thinking about that, I tried to put some of those values into the final generation of the book. Yeah. Uh, Julia, my final character, and as she struggles with what this supper club means to her, she's thinking about it from her point of view as someone who's inheriting this world that's, well, quite frankly, going in the, <laughs> going in the wrong direction. Uh -huh. And she thinks about herself as its steward and is trying to reconcile where this restaurant fits into her ideology. I'm not necessarily trying to say that, uh, to take a step back here, um, it, it's not the point of the book, but when each um, generation inherits this restaurant, they make it their own. Mm -hmm. And Julie is the first generation that comes along that says, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I get to unpack a lot there and also unpack a lot of my feelings I have as a father where I think I don't expect my son to enthusiastically inherit my legacy. Mm -hmm. I expect him to take what he needs and get rid of the rest. I mean, until I, I, I had a child, I thought, well, some poor sap is going to have to gather all my belongings after I die and burn them in a pile somewhere. And uh, now that I have a kid, I'm like, oh, well, he might keep two or three things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's up It's up to him to decide what what he values out of what I leave behind because he could very well look back on my life and go, boy, that was perfectly retrograde, dad. Boy, yeah. you're a real, you're a real relic. <laughs> These things you're nostalgic for are ridiculous. Yeah. You know, he'll, he'll be right, you know, <laughs> but in the meantime, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about them and I write about them because I want them to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the contradiction we live in because I'm I, uh, sitting down and writing this book. I feel like I'm capturing a world as it's changing. Mm -hmm. You know, that, certainly no one is making new supper clubs, or at least they're not doing it at a rate that's exceeding their extinction. Like yeah. it's a style of dining that is waning, uh, but luckily still accessible. And one of the messages I did want to get across in the book is, hey, if you live within driving distance of a supper club, go where you can. I uh, help support these places. Yeah. I Listen, if you're driving to the Midwest, I wholly support I wholly support Jay's, Jay's notion of doing this. It is it is a unique experience that you're absolutely going to love. 
Uh, I we're recording this the day before the book comes out, so I want to be respectful of your time. I know you're doing a lot of situ- a lot of things this week. So what, I have one last question for you. I always end my podcast by having a recommendation from the author. It can be a book. It can be you know uh, a recipe. Something I'm guessing I know what your recommendation might be. But what is something you would like to recommend to my listeners as a as a takeaway from this conversation? Wow, I'm actually going to recommend. Uh, two books. I'm going to recommend a book by a fellow Midwestern author named Christy Clancy called Shoulder Season. It's a set at a Playboy resort that used to exist outside of Madison, Wisconsin, mm-hmm. which sounds horribly improbable to me. But nonetheless, it existed for a time, like in the 70s and 80s. And it's mm-hmm. set there among a you know a local woman who gets gainful employment there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and she did a lot of research and it's very, it, it's very Midwestern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like if if you, whatever you think about the world of Playboy, it you know to a large extent gets disabused and examined through a new light in this book. And Chrissy was a debut author whose first book came out in her fifties, and she teaches at Beloit College and is a the Midwesterner to her core, mm-hmm. and really captures a lot of great Midwestern personalities in that book. And the other book I want to recommend is "They're Going to Love You" by Meg Howery. She's mm-hmm. an author I know who. Not only doesn't have an MFA, she doesn't have a college degree at all. Mm-hmm. She went straight from an arts high school to becoming a professional ballet dancer in New York. She did that till her mid thirties. And this uh, latest book of hers is her fourth. Is well set in the world of ballet. So like Christy Clancy is writing what she knows, but does so in a way that is accessible and interesting to anybody. Mm-hmm. I think there's enough detail for the ballet freak, but it's nonetheless approachable enough for anyone who doesn't know the first thing about ballet. Because her characters are so well drawn. There's not a hair out of place in this book. I admire her writing so much. She just threads that needle, having beautiful writing without creating overly dense prose that makes the pages harder to turn or the plot harder to discern. It's a very character-driven, plot-driven book that nonetheless is beautifully written. It's just like that magic alchemy of literature when everything works. Um, So They're Gonna Love You by Meg Howery and Shoulder Season by Chrissy Clancy are my recommendations, Adam. I love that. All right, Jay, Saturday night at the Lakeside Supper Club is amazing. It's wonderful for everyone, but seriously, if you have any ounce of Midwesterner in you, you have to check it out. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, you're welcome, Adam. Thank you so much for the wonderful conversation. I just, I could talk about Midwestern food with you all day. Passions and Prologues is proud to be an evergreen podcast and was created by Adam Sokol. It was produced by Adam Sokol and Sean Rule Hoffman. And if you are interested in this podcast and any other Evergreen podcast, you can go to evergreenpodcast.com to discover all the different stories we have to tell. Mad Magazine. Advertising mascots. B-movie posters. And cartoons. Oh yeah, can't forget cartoons. If you get the funky connection that ties these pop culture gems together, you'll dig two designers walk into a bar. See, we're a couple of creatively curious pals living between the bookends of grand museums and dive bars. Hey, you know the place. The sweet spot where highbrow and lowbrow become drinking buddies. So join our barroom chats as we talk influential work, and uncover stories of how the familiar became iconic. Think behind the music for the stuff we love. Check out our website at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com and listen wherever you get your podcasts or visit evergreenpodcasts.com.